Happy Friday, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. From 1917 until 1935, Harlem, New York was the mecca for black writers, poets, artists, photographers, and musicians. It's the Harlem Renaissance, a new chapter in the lives of creative African Americans. It was a movement that sparked racial pride and a new definition of the arts, reflective of black culture. Poets like Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, Zora Neale Hurston, and Gwendolyn Bennett gave voice to what it meant to be a Negro in America. Today, it's in another View history lesson, the Harlem Renaissance, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. I know many of you tuned in today because you expect us to talk about what's been going on in Baltimore and uh, and the subsequent uh, protests across the nation, and we will talk about that topic. But I have to tell you, audience, I asked for weeks reprieve. I think that we needed to wait until a lot of the facts are in, until things settle down. And it affects me very personally because I am from Baltimore and my family still lives in Baltimore. And I don't want to have an emotional discussion about it. I want to have a really intellectual talk about what is going on and what is causing um, the things that we've seen this week in our inner cities. And, and, truly what we can do about it. So I invite you to tune in next week that with the round table. That is definitely the topic that we will be talking about. But today, actually, we're talking about a different kind of revolution within the African American community. And that was the Harlem Renaissance. Now I've got a panel of experts here who are going to talk to us about not only what was happening during the Harlem Renaissance and what that meant, but how it affects us today. So welcome, please, uh, Tim Siebels, who is author of Fast Animal and a 2012 National Book Award finalist. Hi, Tim. Hello, Barbara. How you doing? I'm all right. Welcome back. Thank you so much. (laughs) Ramika Bingham, author of What We Ask of Flesh. How you doing, Ramika? I'm fine. I still remember that poem that you read about the beach. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) And Shonda Buchanan, the author of Who's Afraid of Black Indians. Shonda, how you doing? I'm good. 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 Thank you so much for joining me today. So. Let's remind our audience first. Um, I was, I'm going to start with the gentlemen in the room, ladies, if you okay. don't mind. Um, remind us, Tim, what was happening in America in 1917, 1918, that well, caused the Harlem Renaissance? Well, I will, sir, I'll give you, I can only give you a, a brief overview. We could talk for an hour about what was happening <laughs> yeah, then. Exactly. But um, two really important things happened before then that I think are, are planted the seeds of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, the work of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, one who was writing both in what he would have called slave English and in standard English, dealing with the the cultural issues of uh, black people Mm -hmm. um, at the latter part of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Uh, And then Du Bois publishes The Souls of Black Folk in 1904. And I believe Du Bois, if not in this book, not too long after, begins to talk about a talented 10th. Uh, which would be the those black folks who had the opportunities, the educational opportunities, and the and the creative wherewithal to create the true face of black people in this country. Mm-hmm. And so those were the seeds of the Renaissance. Though though he was talking about such things long before the Renaissance actually began to to gain momentum. But of course, in the 1917, there would be of course the very extremely powerful Ku Klux Klan. Uh, During that period, you would have also had um, uh, the beginnings of of the Great Migration North. The Great Migration Uh, North is because people were looking for jobs, looking to get out of the the racist Trying to escape the Klan and other racist uh, uh, aspects of the the South. Mm -hmm. So you would have had that. Um, And you would have also had, I think, a burgeoning restlessness. Uh, I mean, emancipation was, what, 1865? It's a long time for people to still be not quite free, uh, for lack of a better term. 
mm-hmm. yeah. World War you know, One is going on. Right. So um, that certainly made people very restless as well because the people were serving in this war, even in colored regiments, right? Mm-hmm. So this is um, a very tumultuous time for the country, you know, 1914 to 1918, once the, uh, the war ended. But also, you know, what are you coming home to um, if you're a black soldier? And this also gave um, African-American blacks their first taste, um, personal taste, of cross-pollination because they were going to Europe uh, they were fighting overseas, so they were bringing all of this back that they saw. They, so they certainly had a different consciousness. As I, well. you know, really hadn't thought about that point because Absolutely. they were learning some other things Absolutely. outside of America. Absolutely. So, Shonda, when when the Renaissance, you know, started taking shape, I mean, did did the people, the names that we know and so forth, did they realize? that this was actually a renaissance? Was this a purposeful thing? Or do you think they just kind of were going with the times? I think that I'm, I'm going to actually step back to one of um, Tim's comments. He said okay. that you, you kind of have to look at the, the history of it. Mm-hmm. And I want to look at how the, the, the product of the Harlem Renaissance is essentially um, the, the love child of that semiotic relationship of enslavement and, and colonization, right? And so what the the African Americans in the 19, early 1900s were, were dealing with or were actually embodying mm-hmm. were the principles and that the value and the, the aesthetic of, of enslavement and escaping from enslavement, that sharecropper, you know, kind of um, mentality. So for me, um, the Harlem Renaissance definitely represented that, um, that redefinition of what it meant to be an African in America an African American, um, how to reclaim um, that that sense of humanity, mm-hmm. um, and so the poetry, the music, the art um, that was produced became the byproduct of of the heritage of enslavement and colonization. So you asked me, did they realize what was happening? I think that langston hughes had this the sense of it when he wrote his first poem the negro speaks of rivers Mm -hmm. and it was published in 1921 in the crises um which is one of my favorite poems uh i've known rivers to read i was looking in both of the messenger and and selected poems you have it it, tim you know i've known rivers i've known rivers ancient as the flow of human blood and human veins my soul has grown deep like the rivers and you can finish it. You can, you know, pick it up. Um, but that that book kind of helped. That, I'm sorry. That poem oh. connected him to the moment of the the history of the slave, the history of the African, and then the slave, and then the new Negro. So I think that he, at that moment he didn't know it was happening, mm-hmm. but I think he helped propel it forward mm-hmm. when he met Wallace Thurman, his um, his cohort, and then also Zora Neale Hurston. They recognized that there was this energy. There was something different happening. And it wasn't what, quote unquote, the old Negro wanted. It was something different. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how gender played a, played was, a role was, in that. Was there a competition between the, the genres? So the, the musicians, the artists, the poets, I mean, did everybody just kind of rock in their own sphere or was it cross-pollination, well, Ramika? I mean, we have to be clear that there's really been no African-American literary movement in this country country that's completely separate from a musical movement happening at the same time, right? Um, so thinking about the way jazz and blues are starting to flourish in that same time, coming out of the, the spiritual movement and, you know, all that we know of music before jazz and blues, be, you know, became the end-all be-all um, for what we know as African-American and then American music. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those things were happening at the same time when you have... Um, eager, young, excited, Mm -hmm. newly free and freed Mm -hmm. artists all creating at the same time. It's kind of like a bursting of energy. Mm -hmm. Everybody just wants to get something out. Mm -hmm. Um, And they all have different ways to do that. But I think um, what we know of jazz and its improvisational nature, what we know of the blues and its lament along with um, longing um, is kind of just hand in hand with what the writers were doing at the same time. So, and the visual artists as well. So I think it was just kind of an explosion of all of this pent up energy. Tim, you were smiling when I asked that question. Oh, um, well, yeah, there's that. I mean, there's so much to say about this period, but there's that, but there's also the fact that um, as people like 
as people like uh, Langston Hughes uh, came into the into into view, mm-hmm. you also had people like um, uh, Van Vechten, for right. example, a white man right. who was interested in promoting black art, black literature, and so on. So you had a number of which I think which would you would not have found much before this a uh, number of um, relatively wealthy mm-hmm. whites who were also interested in seeing both what what uh, black people were doing mm-hmm. and also how to market it. It wasn't completely altruistic by any means, mm-hmm. but there was a kind of support system uh, financially uh, speaking that didn't exist really uh, outside of the... Of, uh, Can I say Langston uh, Hughes had a patron, the white, and I can't remember her mm-hmm. name, um, Charlotte, I believe. Charlotte Mason. Mason, the, yes, yeah. Mason. Mm-hmm. And so essentially, uh, as a patron, as someone who paid his rent mm-hmm. <laughs> and said... We, w- we would like you to keep producing what you're producing. So the beginning of his work, I think, was definitely talking about what it meant to be an African in America. And it was the sense of, um, for, for her and other patrons, it was that exotic or exoticism. It was the sense of, um, talk about your primitive African roots and you know share that with us. And so at a point, Langston Hughes and others became, um, they recognized that they were essentially being pimped out. And it was like, we're more than... Africa. We are a seed in America that has grown and we should have the same kinds of equality that you have. So when the poetry and the music and the um, uh, the sense in Harlem Renaissance, uh, the Harlem Renaissance started to turn a bit as in we want what you have, then it became I don't know if we can support you financially. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so then they they switched it because they weren't doing what they wanted. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Zora okay. certainly ran into that also with Charlotte Absolutely. Osgood Mason. Same, Same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, as she became more uh, more insistent upon certain truths about the black experience, uh, Charlotte Osgood uh, Mason was less supportive. Uh, but but with regard to Van Vechten, and I think he's was he the, I think he ran. Knopf, right? The press, right? Mm-hmm. And back then, and, and well, Hughes remained tight for his whole life, mm-hmm. as far as mm-hmm. I know. So I, I would not want to paint all white patrons sure. with the same brush. Gotcha. Right. Because sure. there were certainly those who did see black folks as exotic, who were not necessarily interested in really the central issue, which is, are black people human, and may they enjoy the same rights as everyone else? Right. They might not have been interested in that, but there were those who, in fact, were. And so I would just say it's a little more complicated um, than I, than sometimes we would like to imagine it. But you, you had the whole range of uh, of people. And I'm going to get to some of the poems from that era in just a minute. But first, let me open up the phone lines, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Those are the numbers to call to join our conversation. We're talking about the Harlem Renaissance and the lessons learned from it and the lessons that we are still learning or implementing today. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So before we read some of the poems, how, how do people live in Harlem? When they, when they were arriving, you know, you were saying that the patron paid Langston Hughes rent. I mean, were they taking little jobs and just doing their art or... Kind of give me a sense of what was happening well, with was, that, Shonda. It was interesting because um, Langston Hughes would take any job that he could take, <laughs> right? And and because he, he wanted to feel his art, he wanted to create, and he knew that. Um, and um, it, in, in Harlem itself, so maybe someone could talk about the actual jobs that he had there, but I'm going to take you across, uh, across the, the waters. Mm-hmm. In Paris, he was a bellhop at uh, a club called, um, at Bricktop's Club. Wow. Bricktop was um, uh, an African-American woman who started a club in Paris. And when Langston heard about this, he said, I, I need to get there. I need to see what's happening. So he was a bellhop there. He wow. lived in a hotel, um, a one-room um, a one room hotel with a, a French um, actress and uh, subsided off of his art and the food from the club. So, so essentially, that's he did whatever he could. He would hop a freighter. Uh, actually, several times throughout his life, he basically just would hop on a ship, and that would be his free passage over to Europe, back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, so the kind of jobs that he took in New York itself, I'm not sure. 
Ramika? I think uh, absolutely. And, you know, even, you know, as close to us in D.C., you know, Langston did the same often. You know, bus, bus Boys and Poets Restaurant is kind of around that, <laughs> you know, that lore about, um, but it's not lore about, um, you know, Langston taking uh, different kinds of jobs. But it's also interesting um, just thinking about what was happening at the time that this was also the first time that um, African Americans really started talking about class because there was finally really emerging a black middle class and an upper echelon. And um, oftentimes uh, people, uh, you know, place the Harlem Renaissance starting in like 1917, 1919. Mm -hmm. Um, I really, I think it's 1916, which uh, there was a play called Rachel, um, Angela Weld Grimke, who's a woman who's not talked about as much as Earl Mm -hmm. Hurston, but was certainly Mm -hmm. as influential at the time. And that play uh, was about lynching. Um, but it was also about colorism, about class. It was um, the first play that was staged um, in New York and beyond where there were upper class, middle class black folks portrayed on the stage without dialect um, who were just living lives. Uh, you know, her father was the second graduate from Harvard Law School, Angela Wood Grimke's mm-hmm. father. Um, and so there was this middle class of blacks that didn't have to live piecemeal anymore, right? Langston was kind of the free spirited, <laughs> you know, he was the poet in all of us, yeah. you know? Um, and so he, he kind of did whatever he needed to do to just kind of make the way for his art. But some of these folks uh, were teaching at universities, were going through Ivy League schools. And wasn't there also kind of a, a, a trying to figure out whether we were, they were creating black culture, if you will, versus or assimilating into the general culture. Do, yeah. do you understand well, what I mean? Well, that that was Negro kind of a constant huh? debate. I mean, it depends <laughs> on who you were right. talking to. Yeah, you know, uh, there were those who, well, George Shuler, yep. as you know, mm-hmm. we talked about the, uh, what is it, the Negro art hokum. Mm-hmm. There is no such thing as black art. Now, people say, oh, he was just being sarcastic, but I don't know. I've looked at that essay. I'm trying to find a place where it seems like he's being sarcastic, but I don't find it. And he suggested that the experience of middle class, he said black people in general, but I imagine he intended middle class black folks was the same as the experience of a, of a white middle class person. They're educated the same. They experience the world the same. They eat the same food. They dress the same clothes. And he said, so there's no such thing as black art. It's just people, American and people art. still really... Re- re- still believe that to this uh, day. I guess, right. but right. goodness right. gracious. I, I just think there was that. And then, of course, you have Langston mm-hmm. Hughes on the other mm-hmm. end of the spectrum. And you had, um, you know, Du Bois, who would have been, I don't know, playing toward the middle between those. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I think Du Bois would have definitely believed there was black art, but he would have said, I mean, Hughes is saying, the hell with everybody, you know. We're going to do what we want to do as black artists, and if you don't like it too bad, white or black, if you don't like it. Mm-hmm. And Du Bois would have, that would have, I think, would have thought, well... We want to make an art that will command the respect of everyone. Right. And I think Hughes was like, whatever. But yeah. it didn't Du Bois or mm-hmm. and others also want the artists to use their talents to promote the the black movement, if you will, um, to make it more of a statement as opposed to just a, assimilating into the general population. Really, Absolutely. the intelligentsia essentially. Mm-hmm. It was it was okay. about. We want to show that we have the same kinds of intellect as our white counterparts, our artists, our um, our musicians, our um, our thinkers, our politicians. We want to show that. And it, what's interesting, I, I guess I go back to the, the historical piece of it because mm-hmm. Langston Hughes is biracial. Um, du Bois, um, there are other people who have this, they have that relationship or that connection to to whites in America. So so the, the movement is about defining yourself as African-American only because that was what was allotted to us at the time, I think. You had to That's claim right. that you African claim. piece of it, right? So I think a part of that discussion as it moves on becomes, okay, well, actually Langston Hughes says, you know, in Cross, you know, I'm, I'm the son of a, mm-hmm. uh, of a uh, white man. I'm the yeah. son of a black woman, yeah. you know, and you know, we definitely should read it's that poem. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so it became that struggle of that, that by ethnic struggle at the same time. And then we haven't talked about gender yet yeah. because. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what was going on? Let's talk about Langston gender. Langston <laughs> Hughes was bisexual. And when I tell my students that they're saying, are you, what are you kidding? Oh, I you, know, know? you know, when I was reading up on this, cause I really had to go back and, and reread yeah. and restudy. Yes. And, and there was, there was a lot lot of of a, a there was a sexual rev- revolution as well yes, going absolutely. through this whole thing let's yes, talk about absolutely. that a little bit bruce nugent was a, an amazing <laughs> author and just a really thoughtful thoughtful thinker and he was he was definitely you know um a, a gay man you know writing about out 
in a, in a, yeah, in a very in a way that Langston might not have been exactly was out. Exactly. Oh, okay. Nobody didn't know that Bruce Nugent was gay. Yeah, mm-hmm. this is true. Mm-hmm. This is true. And so, I mean, the work that he produced essentially talked about that struggle between being a black gay man in America, very much that in the vein of James Baldwin at the same time. There was also a lot of interracial dating and, interracial. Yeah. and so forth, right? Um, and that was the new time for that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, I mean, ahead, and just kind of piggybacking back to gender for a second. Um, you know, we talk so much about the men of the Harlem Renaissance. I was really glad that Tim Siebel's reminded me to go back to this book called Double Take, a revisionist Harlem Renaissance mm. anthology um, by Patton and Honey, which um, is fantastic because there are, were so many women, as many if not more women, that were really not only the artists but the gatekeepers in mm-hmm. many ways. You know, Jesse Redmond Fawcett was one of the editors at one of the huge black periodicals, um, you know, Crisis Opportunity, all these mm-hmm. periodicals are publishing people. Um, and and really the women were doing as much work as the men yes. and writing very specifically about what we would today call feminist or womanist mm-hmm. issues, right? Do you have a poem? Absolutely. Go I ahead, have Effie one. Lee Newsom, um, who's a writer that's um, not as well known from that time, but a woman who published more than 100 poems in the crisis during the Harlem Renaissance. Mm-hmm. This is The Bronze Legacy to a Brown Boy. Tis a noble gift to be brown, all brown, like the strongest things that make up this earth, like the mountains grave and grand, even like the trunks of trees, even oaks to be like these, God builds his strength in bronze. To be brown like thrush and lark, like the subtle wren so dark, nay, the king of beasts wears brown. Eagles are of this same hue. I thank God then I am brown. Brown has mighty things to do. Wow. Mm. You know <laughs> I mean, what? That takes us to our caller because sure. I think the the question he has relates to this. Fred sure. joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Fred. You're on the air. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Fred Quarles. Um, I um, grew up in the Detroit area, born in the 50s, grew up during the 60s. And, the, um, and basically, now I'm a dermatologist. Mm-hmm. And so I deal with the, uh, I, I got introduced to Langston Hughes early in my grade school, uh, in Detroit Public Schools. They made uh, African-American history and literature a part of the curriculum. Unfortunately, a lot of schools don't do that anymore. And one thing I want to say is my children, my boys went to UBA and someone shared Langston Hughes autobiography with them and shared with them that his grandmother's name was Quarles that he visited in Richmond, Virginia. Oh. Turns out I don't think I'm related, but that <laughs> made me even want to pick the book up even more. But to make my question is, how are we going to instill um, the Harlem Renaissance? And the thing, you know, those of us, you know, who have chosen to be called black or African-American, um, and I'm proud of our heritage and proud of our roots, but yet still I see young people 30 and under, let me say 35 and under, the millennials, the X generation, the Z generation. Mm-hmm. How do we get them to want to embrace their heritage, the greater heritage that Langston Hughes talked about in the Renaissance, the Harlem Renaissance? Okay, Fred, I thanks. I find so- that a challenge. How, do we, how are we going to mm-hmm. be able to do that with all this unrest in Baltimore? Exactly. And well, let's, areas, let's, let our, we that? let's let our let's let our panelists give you an answer. Thanks so much for calling, and good to hear from you, Fred. <laughs> I happen to know him. So, oh, yeah. um, okay, who wants to answer the question? Oh, I could start. I mean, uh, it's it's hard to certainly it's hard to get get people interested in the Harlem Renaissance now. But I would contend it's hard to get enough people, certainly folks of color, black people in particular, to read more black authors, period, mm. uh, let alone Renaissance, black arts mm. movement, or, or in the contemporary moment. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the thing. And I wouldn't say it's a, a problem exclusively for black people. I'm thinking white people probably having the same issues in terms of, uh, of, a, of a kind of a diminished readership. Um, uh, but I'm so I'm not sure exactly if the educational systems aren't going to embrace all of them. If it's not going to be taught in high school, which it certainly, at least in my high school, it was not. And many high schools I ask my students about say they don't teach it. If it's not taught, I'm not sure how you can impose the interest on people. Um, 
uh, unless you have parents. My parent, my mother was an English teacher, for example. Her her English teacher was Arna Bontemps, who mm-hmm. wrote this, who put this together. Anyway, who was in the Harlem Renaissance. So she's telling me about it. But that's mm-hmm. a unique uh, uh, experience. That's not going to happen to many people. Ramika? I, I think, though, you know, it's it's funny what ends up holding on. I don't know, you know, where we are in time, Barbara, but a poem that I've seen making its way on social media all week is County. I've heard now that he pronounced his name Counte. Cullen, oh, did he? Of County. Okay. So okay. Counte, um, Cullen, who's a Harlem Renaissance writer. It's a short poem, but it's called Incident, and it okay. kind of speaks to Fred's question. Um, Once riding in old Baltimore, heart filled, head filled with glee, I saw a Baltimorean kept looking straight at me. Now I was eight and very small, and he was no whit bigger. And so I smiled, but he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. Wow. Um, <laughs> what year right. was this that? Is, when, this when? is County Cullen, and I believe it was around 1919, somewhere between 1919 and 1924. I'll try, yeah, I'll try to have to find the date. But the way that I do this, I mean, I think we're all taking Harlem Renaissance into our classrooms. Mm-hmm. Um, I just right. finished teaching African American Lit and taught I'm Harlem Renaissance. Uh-huh. Um, and so one of the things that I do with my students, no matter what I'm teaching, is I take the work and then I connect it to current events. Exactly. Fortunately, people were already connecting this poem. This wasn't up to the, the poets necessarily. Um, and so as long as you still find resonance in the work, and exactly. obviously a lot of the issues that Counte Cullen is writing about here are it some of the myriad to, issues to that the we're still, the issue. you know, that mm-hmm. we're still thinking about. So finding that connection helps. If you're just joining us, we're talking with three incredible poets and university professors, Tim Siebels, Ramika Bingham, and Shonda Buchanan. You know what? I've got so many questions. I don't even know where to go next. Yep. Can, Can I you respond read a poem? to Fred as well? Yes. <laughs> so, so this this kind of speaks to that sense of um, the, if you have passion for it, it rather, if you have a, a passion or a feeling to learn how to express what you what's going on in your life, generally, even as a young person, you're going to pick up a pencil and you're going to try to write something. Even if you don't, don't, don't know how to say it, you're going to write something. Um, In terms of how do we get, Fred, your question was, how do we get our students to maybe appreciate the Harlem Renaissance or recognize the Harlem Renaissance or transfer the values, I think is what Mm -hmm. you're trying to say. So I'll just say in my class, I make my students do their own what I've known poem. So I take Mm. in the I've known Rivers poem, but what do you know? So I make that direct connection for them, right? Um, and then throughout the class, they're they're teaching the class. So they're actually making their own kinds of connection to language and the power of language and what it can do to help you identify um, yourself and who you are. Um, if in order to bring back the Harlem Renaissance, I think that it, 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 it needs to be introduced, of course, in the schools as a movement. But I think that multicultural poetry needs to be introduced into the schools as um, we too sing America, mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. as in you, Ch- the Chinese helped build America and Africans helped build America and the Filipinos were in Mississippi. And so we have to actually recognize that um, the people were here and the language does follow. Mm-hmm. And I'll read one of Claude McKay's poems, okay. um, which I think speaks to that, um, what's happening right now, definitely in Baltimore, but also the sense of um, how when something happens, how do we express ourselves? I guess I'll just say that. Um, If we must die. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and pinned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us die nobly, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us through though dead. O kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What they, what though before us lies the open grave. Like men, we'll face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. And I have to say, when I teach that poem and when I read that poem, I, I want to 
tell my students I'm not attempting to make you go out into the streets and cause a revolution. But at the same time, that poem was meant to make people go out into the streets and cause a revolution. So I think a revolution of language has to happen. A, a physical revolution, uh, a revolution has to happen. A metaphysical revolution has to happen mm -hmm. um, on multiple levels. So who was reading the works of the artists in the Harlem Renaissance? Well, you had a black readership, but you also had a, probably easily the same size, if not larger, white readership, Absolutely. truthfully. True. Uh, but surely uh, there were black folks reading it. But if you think about, um, I mean, there would have been a large number of black folks who might not have been especially literate at that time. So it mm -hmm. would have been not easy to just pass Langston Hughes' poems or Gwendolyn Bennett's poems around uh, in certain places, but I was talking to my students about this. Even people who didn't necessarily hear the poems or see the poems themselves, they heard about the yes. poems. Mm -hmm. They heard about okay. what was going on. They heard about black poets. They heard about black thinkers and heard about black people with real agency mm -hmm. and real and real pride and real a real uh, uh, determination where uh, the experience of black folks was concerned. And those things count. Those whispers in the wind are are very important. Uh, what, do you, what do you all think it says about the growth in this country, the racial growth in this country, that the poems that the two, the two of you have read could have been written mm -hmm. today? Absolutely. <laughs> and, it, and they were written back in the 1917s through 35. Then they could have been written today. What, what does that say about what's going on in our society? History is reciprocal. <laughs> the things that we have not conquered um, come back to haunt us. And I think in specifically in the poetry for disenfranchised communities such as Baltimore, such as Watts, Nickerson Downs, Jordan Gardens, such as Chicago, which they now call Chirac, you know, because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. people are upset about that. <laughs> right, exactly. So so people are still experiencing the same kinds of things um, economically um, and class class wise that were experienced back in, the you know, 1910, 1920s, 1930s. Uh, in communities of color. And so I think that it could have been written now. And, and actually students, young people, not just students, but people are writing these same kinds of poems. And Split This Rock in, in Washington, D.C. And I know, Tim, you've read for Split This Rock, but, you know, they're a, a, a group, an organization that promotes the social change through poetry. Mm -hmm. And I think with organizations like this, they recognize that are we ever going to be this utopian society? Probably not. But at least language is here to identify the kinds of things that still need to change that we, we are wrestling with um, as, 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 as humans. Okay, let's go to the phone lines. Lance joins us from Long Island, New York. Hi, Lance. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Mm hmm you guys have a wonderful uh, show this morning. And, um, Thank you. I just wanted to, I, I was listening and um, I, you know, I'm late 30s, and I was lucky enough to, um, you know, I come from a really old family. They uh, they bought property in Queens back in uh, like the the late 1800s, and I used to ask my grandmother and my my great grandmother growing up, you know, what was it like um, to grow up in the early 1900s, and how was racism? And and I I remember that she told me one time that. Everything was hard for everyone. Mm -hmm. They didn't have time to worry about it. Mm -hmm. She said they took any job they can get from being a seamstress to a tailor. The men did brickwork. Um, they worked as pipe fitters. Uh, they lived in a time where if they had a skill, even if there wasn't opportunity, they had a skill where they can go out and find their own work. And I was fascinated by that response because I think today for our youth, there's no opportunity for them, but they also don't have skills so that when there's no opportunity, they can't find other jobs to do. And, and Lance, do you have a question for, for our, no. um, our audience? I mean, yeah, for I, our I, panel? How do we get back to that time where everyone, you know, they, Langston Hughes, he made his own way. He, was, he thought outside the box. How do we get back to that time for our youth so that we don't have people that are just 
you know, be feel hopeless. Okay, let's let let's let the panel answer. Thanks so much for your call, Lance. We appreciate it. Uh, that's a really interesting um, mm-hmm. take on things, Lance. Mm-hmm. So um, thanks for at least calling up and, and having that conversation with us. But I think one thing that I'm noticing, and I'm really hoping that um, this is becoming the trend, uh, we, we are kind of recognizing what um, young folks can do. I, I mean, the, the traditional pattern of things has maybe been to – uh, deny some of the things that, that they love as being insignificant. And mm. the young folks right now, I mean, we were just talking about this mobile justice app mm-hmm. that the ACLU right. has mm-hmm. developed. I'm telling you, some young people developed this app, right? right. <laughs> um, so thinking about the way young people are really spurring on these movements by the means of things like social media, mm-hmm. by the means of technology, mm-hmm. um, by the means of their own particular kinds of art, not to talk about the young visual artists that right. are working now, the right. Kara Walkers in the world. Oh, yes. I mean, oh, so yes. there are all kinds of people that are doing the work and still thinking about um, ways to make changes socially as well, um, but also letting them work through their spirit. That, that was something that the Harlem Renaissance writers, because of the, um, we haven't even talked about the WPA, but because of Roosevelt's Work Progress True. Administration, True. True. Um, you know, th- that was kind of one little step that let the, if you think you right. can write, well, here's some opportunities exactly. to do that. We don't have things like that now, but there are plenty of other opportunities for young people, especially through means of technology, to mm-hmm. latch, on, latch on to things that they're terribly interested in, whether it be art or otherwise, and I think that's the way that we support them in that. Okay. Can I answer go that ahead. too? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I apologize. Um, well, go ahead, I'll just Tim. Say briefly, go ahead, Tim. But, but you also need, we need the kind of educational system that will prepare mm-hmm. young people mm-hmm. of all colors, yes. certainly mm-hmm. kids of color, but all of all colors, to, to be able to take advantage of certain opportunities. I mean, you, I guess there's always a way to find out, uh, to, to make a living or to add something constructive to the culture, but... What I'm seeing in the in the school systems, the public school systems in particular, especially in the cities, is that the students, I don't I don't think are being prepared to really engage the culture in a constructive way. Not really. Mm-hmm. They're just being passed through somehow, mm-hmm. uh, and gotten out of getting them out of school somehow. I'm not sure they're getting the tools necessarily that they need, that to, they need. to add. Um, so, so a, a part of it definitely is the education system, but at the same time. I ask my students, what can you make, <laughs> right? What actually, if, if you were tossed out there, what could you make? And this question just, it's what? What do you mean? Do we have to actually make something? And so they don't realize that they sometimes, sometimes, that they exist in a time when they don't have to make a shoe. <laughs> you know, yeah. they don't have to have a, a kind of trade, but it's good if you do have that. The other piece of this is self-feed. And I I tell my students, just because I'm bringing this literature to you and you have to read this poem and I'm going to grade you on on literary construction or um, or the format. After class ends, how are you going to self feed? You know, how are you going to take this and and own it and make it your own so that you are in not just if you don't like the poem? okay, that's fine. But you should know the poem. You should know this movement. And if you don't. Um, and if you do, then you can teach someone else. Mm-hmm. So that, that sense of self-feeding is something I think that w- our generation, it, it, at least from my perspective, they don't have the same kinds of self-feed that I had. I Am the Darker Brother was the book published in 1968 by, um, by Knopf. And the, the foreword was wit- written by um, a librarian, Charlene Rollins. And her foreword was... This I, I decided to help compile this book because young African Americans don't have a sense of history. They don't have a sense of the aesthetic. And her, when I was, I don't know, I think I, I accidentally stole this book from my cousin, but I was 10 maybe. <laughs> and so I didn't quite understand everything that she was saying, but I realized that it had to do with me, you know. And so that was the moment of self-feeding for me. Mm. And I wish that our students and our young people all of all colors had that white, black, Asian, Hispanic. I wish they had that. Absolutely. Let's go to the phone lines. Nathan joins us from Suffolk. Hi, Nathan. You're on the air. Hello, uh, Barbara. I just, this is why I keep uh, telling everybody to have the call-in number to another view on speed dial. <laughs> because you got, you got three of the heaviest hitters in Hampton Roads. You're on one, too, Nathan Richardson. We Thank you, Nathan. We love you, Nathan. 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 <laughs> wow. <laughs> I turned on my radio and I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to give them a, an opportunity to read some of their own work. So yes, we're going to. Yes. I just wanted to uh, 
to congratulate you all on, on this particular topic uh, mm. and just listening to all the comments about, you know, how the youth and every every movement uh, throughout history has been a youth movement. And these three professors are certainly connected to youth and connected to what well, poets are saying, not only in the point. classroom, so are you. but in the streets as well. Nathan, so. Nathan does the, um, the, what is it, Gross, Downing Gross? Am I saying that correctly, Nathan? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Down in gross youth Culture poet system. slam. Yeah. So yes. and, and when we talk about people who are exciting youth about language, yeah, Nathan is one of it. them. Deirdre, um, what's Deirdre's last Deirdre name? Love. Is love. Deirdre, Deirdre Love. Deirdre Love right. is someone right. who's Deirdre exciting love. our youth mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. We, we yeah. want it. So I just, th- I just want to thank them for uh, keeping that gap narrow <laughs> uh, because <laughs> one of my comments about, you know, Baltimore, Ferguson, whatever, is that, you know, it's really a, about, a, you know, a global thing where if, if you have a, a, a class of people that are uh, economically and socially uh, deprived, then, then bad things are going to happen. Sure. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a growing gap between the have-sums and the have-nones mm-hmm. that makes the gap between the haves and the have-nots even that much wider. And so these, these three panelists here are, are narrowing that gap by... Uh, letting people know that you know, if, if you can express yourself through through words uh, mm-hmm. and literacy, then uh, then you're gonna you're gonna be able to foretell the fire next time. <laughs> okay, Nathan, thanks yeah. so much for the call. Thanks, we got to run, but thank you so thank much. You. Uh, <laughs> let's see, let's see if we can take another call. Um, a day, if I pronounce that correctly, from Virginia yes, Beach. Sir. Yes, it's a day from Virginia Beach. Uh, Hi. I'm enjoying the show, and I'll be very brief. Uh, I'm one of the younger generation. I'm actually 31 years old, uh-huh. uh, and I grew up in New York. And what I what I've what I've learned to understand is that as Africans, as 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 an original people, we're very creative, and we're always evolving and moving forward. And what I've noticed has happened with the energy that has sprouted out of the Harlem Renaissance has pretty much, in in my opinion, has has been. Uh, uh, moved into the energy that that sprouted hip hop and the hip hop culture, mm-hmm. and to see how it has impacted things globally, uh, and 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 so the the sense that we're still connected to what was established in Harlem, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 through through our hip hop culture nowadays, and also our hip hop is also influencing global uh, awareness. Mm-hmm. Uh, recently on NPR, we were talking about Harry Potter mm-hmm. and how the stories of Harry Potter can impact how uh, privileged children. Uh, have have empathy towards mm-hmm. those who are not so privileged. I, I believe that hip hop has done that on a global scale. So now, where everyone around the world understands what we as African Americans are facing here in this country because of the social commentary that we get through hip hop. Okay. And most recently, we have guys like Kendrick Lamar, who's released a great album mm-hmm. uh, with with a lot of influence from what we've experienced in the, in the Renaissance. And uh, artists such as Nas, whose dad. Uh, is is a jazz musician who was very who was influenced yeah. by right. Right. Yeah. Okay, Ade, thank you so much thank for calling you, in. We really appreciate your your comments. So, and hip hop is the new expression, the new poetry, the the movement from you know that is going on today. I think hip hop is definitely a part of that transformative um, spoken word. You know, a, a spoken word. Um, so, so young people are have borrowed. Um, I guess techniques that they don't even recognize that existed in the Harlem Renaissance, right? So I always say that there couldn't have been a Lauryn Hill without a Nina Simone. You know, there couldn't have been um, a, a Most Deaf without a Langston Hughes or James Baldwin. You know, so so there is that sense of that connective, transformative quality. Absolutely, Tim. But also, I mean, we—I uh, don't want to skip over the Black Arts Movement. That yes. was a really central, <laughs> central connect connecting uh, bridge between the Harlem Renaissance and our contemporary uh, yes. uh, our scene because you think about the last poets for example oh, they were yeah. doing what oh, we yeah. called That's spoken word back up. then yes. Gil Scott Heron same True. thing Nikki Giovanni True. you know ego tripping all those I'm things would, would have fall under yeah Baraka all those things would have fallen under the umbrella of spoken word mm-hmm. it just wasn't called spoken word then mm-hmm. yeah. but I just I just think that there is a constant current between all these movements um, I certainly feel uh, the weight and influence of both the Black Arts Movement and the Harlem Renaissance in my own sensibility and my own imaginings of myself as a black person and as a black person who is an artist. Those things are always with us. And I hope in 100 years they'll still be, you know, they'll still that current will still be connected. Let's take one more call and then I'm going to let you guys read some of your poetry. Okay, I promise. Anne joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Anne. You're in the air. Hi, how are you? Okay, how I are you? I just wanted to call you about... Um, an album or CD that was written by a Norfolk native, Ken Hatfield. 
he took Langston Hughes' poetry and put it to jazz. Mm. And it was produced last year, and it is an absolutely incredible piece of music. Oh, nice. oh wow. So, I have to look him up. I um, that. Thank you. Did it on Amazon. Um, Ken graduated from Lick Taylor and um, lives in New York and just does great things. But this Langston CD that he wrote last year is just an awesome piece of jazz. Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that, Ann. We appreciate that. So we have been talking about the Harlem Renaissance. You all obviously have been immersed in poetry be pers- on a personal level. Yes. So I want each of you to read one of your poems. Tell us about it. And um, and let's hear some poetry. Let's start with you, Sean. So I'm, I'm going to preface this poem. Um, I taught a Harlem Renaissance um, creative writing class in Bath, England in 2008 and it was interesting because that was the class that uh went the fastest students they really wanted to be to learn about the harlem renaissance um Mm -hmm. and how they connected to europe essentially Mm -hmm. so this poem wordsworth speaks harlem was written at tintern abbey which is (laughs) where wordsworth um he actually was on a a bluff looking at tintern abbey in england and he wrote um the poem ah it's escaping me how is that (laughs) i sing the blue uh, uh i sing the body electric Oh, it'll come back to me. Okay. So we got this about is the poem. seven minutes I'm so sorry. total okay. in the show. So let's uh, keep Wordsworth going. <laughs> speaks Harlem. And uh, I saw you, Josephine, and all the other Josephines, satin by the sleek porous spotlight, that fragile forested night, hot eyes pressed against your waxy glow, feathered harness, the scared St. Louis of your eyes. It was fall, the midnight crisp of autumn, sat in the pink cool of my mouth like sycamore leaves as the horn smoked around your bu- your naked belly. I knew then that you were leaving, and as men do, I felt love for you then. And I- even the motion of human blood and human veins slowed me, and for a moment I forgot the silver music, the cry of deep rivers in the belly of English woods. You and I became nature's eternal timeless shadow of stone and rock, Josephine, calling to the onyx inside me, unfolding the porcelain of you, and I smelled the clotted blood of autumn dusk under your breath, cracked by freedom, stolen by the remittance of the dance, and I recognized it, but I did not own it, and it was never a primitive thing. Wow, that's Mm, beautiful. Okay, we got, you got about two minutes. You got a two-minute poem for me, Rumika? Shorter than that. (laughs) So Harlem Renaissance women were certainly reclaiming their humanity and their sensuality and desire. So Mm -hmm. this is, we awaken near the ocean after being married. I was spark or light. You were bright bead of salt and hum and teeth. We transformed stone and ore, sharp clasps, our clay and ash, fever slick. The ear to the ground in our room would have heard one wild bruising art. Brick brash flaring, hunger and belly full, fully fleshed. One thing I know for sure, the heart is like the sea with its dark urging. Wide over everything, breathless and breaking. Yes. (laughs) Man. Yes. All right, Mr. Siebel, it's okay, your turn. I have a very short poem. I didn't. I don't have anything on me, but I think I remember it. it's a poem called "Refugee." And I would. You I did guess, not bring your own poem. I Are know, you serious? I was thinking all about the home Renaissance. <laughs> but uh, this 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 poem, "Refugee," we're talking about Gene Toomer, and I'll I'll dedicate it to Gene Toomer because <laughs> this is on the mystical edge, I guess, of things. Um, called "Refugee," landed here, my brown skin like a noise. Between two mouths, a temple, one kiss, and I have no name. I give it away. I step out of an hour, wait for the house in my blood to open. I am speechless. Mm. (laughs) Tell Mm. people about Gene Tumor real quickly. (laughs) Uh, well, he would, as I was reading during my studies, I would, he really just kind of freaked me out a little bit. Yeah, well, he well he's most best known for being the author of Cain, 
yeah. which is a brilliant book. And I think if it was released today, would still be kind of surprising in terms mm -hmm. of the experimental aspects, mm -hmm. you know, mixing uh, the genres right and so there. on, mm -hmm. uh, prose and poetry and so yeah. on. Um, I guess toward the end of his life, uh, well, middle and onward, he denied having a race at all. He himself, of course, was of mixed heritage. Um, but at the end, he just said, I do not have a race. Yeah. I don't have a race. Mm -hmm. And tried to kind of <laughs> denounce. And I, I don't think he meant it as a, a, a pejorative yeah, against black people I don't or think white so people. Either. He just was tired of the construct. I think completely. And wasn't he? If I think I read correctly, he was he was very light skinned, yes. so he yeah. he could pass. Yes, in, he could. in that in that era. And yes, he could. That may have played a lot of role into <laughs> um, what was going on. We got one last call up there, so let's go to it. Tanya joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Tanya. You're on the air. Hi, Barbara Hamley. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> I am fine. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I just wanted to say, I just wanted to make a quick comment about um, we must take back our homes and teach these lessons to our children in the home. I remember when I was stationed in Cincinnati, Ohio, my son was in preschool, and a treat for him, every week we would go to the African American bookstore and buy a book of poetry. Good. And to hear him recite those same poems Good. today, oh, it is amazing. The poems that the author, that you guys were talking about on air, uh -huh. he and I were going over those poems just, mm -hmm. I got goosebumps Can because I? <laughs> I taught him, me and his father That's at the good. time, That's taught good. him those poems from preschool on. Wonderful. And he's 26 years old today. So if we do it in the home, good. then they too, those, our children will pass them on to their children. We'll Absolutely. Pass them on their children. Okay, you know, thank you so much, Tanya. We appreciate the call. We're go ahead. I wanted to ahead, respond Shonda. to you. Uh -huh. um, so, so is your yes in the home definitely? But there's also I, I'm going to go to Colonial Williamsburg, which my husband is um, Harold Caldwell. He he is one of the interpreters at the African American Ensemble. And if you want to take your children to a place where you can see some of this living history of the aesthetic of what it meant to be a slave, or you know, in colonial times, or in in I guess the um, how how the Harlem Renaissance, you know, what they wrote about. You can take them to Colonial Williamsburg, um, the Randolph House, the Great Hopes Plantation, and you can see African Americans or and hear them interpreting the history um, at the same time. So the poetry definitely is important. And you're such a good parent for doing that, I have to say. Thank you, Tanya, so much. We really appreciate that call. You know, I could just talk to you guys like forever. This is just incredible. We've only got a minute left, though, in the show. So <laughs> I want to, to thank all of you for first of Thank all, you. for being a part of the show. And I just want to ask one real quick question, but one word answer from you. Tell me something to encourage people to go read poetry. Oh, man. Just In one word. Or one, one, one word. phrase. A, sentence, right. a short phrase or a short <laughs> sentence. Right. It's as contemporary as you want it to be. Um, poetry okay. is about everything that's happening in the world right here, right now. So find Fantastic. Song. Okay. Yeah, Tim. I would agree. Poetry is is the song. Is the it's the uh, musical accompaniment and the verbal accompaniment to our lives. And a life without poetry is a life not quite lived. Yeah. <laughs> Shonda, don't be afraid. Um, so many people are afraid to approach poetry in all its facets. And poetry can be anything. Poetry is everything. I mean, it's from this this earthquake in Nepal to what's happening in Baltimore to the, the love of that, that a mother feels for a child. Okay. So, so. That is Shonda Buchanan, Ramika Bingham, and Tim Siebels. Thank you all so much. And that's our show for today. If you missed something or want to tell someone else about Another View, go on over to our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. You can also sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once-a-week reminder of upcoming shows. And we are only 15 likes away from 1,000 on Facebook. So like us, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Next week, as I promised you before, we we're going to have thoughtful and sobering conversation about the Baltimore police and the African-American community and things that have been going on there. Roger Carroll, Will and Bill join us for the Another View Roundtable. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Chantel Davis answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Make it a great weekend, everyone. And let's get together again next Friday at noon for Another View. <laughs>